people don't realize, probably the most uh, unappreciated um, and marginalized group of anti-Zionist Jewish people in the world are represented here today by uh, Rabbi Weiss and Rabbi Feldman. It is an enormously important, a, a very large community of Jews that have been standing in opposition to Zionism for a hundred years. It's really longer than, than, than anybody else. And paying a heavy price, a very heavy price, uh, particularly since the state of Israel was established, uh, paying a very, very heavy price for standing up against Zionism, for standing with Palestinians, for partnering with Palestinians, and perhaps one of the most important campaigns um, the, 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 one of the most important campaigns that they uh, that exist within their community is the anti-draft campaign. They stand in opposition to the draft of Israel the military. They oppose it. They refuse it. Um, and um, we don't hear much about it. But the price that they pay, the young, ultra-Orthodox men and women uh, have to pay because they refuse to serve, particularly now that the laws there's really laws of change in this regard. They pay a heavy price. And I did an interview with a young uh, yeshiva, a yeshiva student in Jerusalem a, few, a couple of months ago. And the stories of being persecuted by the secret police, by the intelligence services and all that is something that um, we should remember and appreciate. Because their struggle has been, like I said, linked to the Palestinian struggle and the struggle against Zionism. Going back uh, about 100 years, if I'm not mistaken, but, uh, and maybe more. So again, thank you for being here. It's a it's a it's a, it's a pleasure to see you again. And um, I want to link back to the presentation that uh, that David gave here earlier, that brilliant presentation about the about Israeli politics and that complicated web of of, of political parties and so on. Um, I thought it was interesting. He stood here with uh, with the Torah scrolls talking about the Torah. We <laughs> have two Orthodox rabbis. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have had the courage to do that. But um, you know, I think, I think what we saw in the end, that very last piece of his presentation, where the, really the man that symbolizes moderate Zionism, and moderate Israel, who is today the, state, this is the president of the state of Israel, it's Haik Herzog, and his father was a president, and his father was a general, you know, the, he represents this moderate, good Zionism, good Israel, is good Israel, has linked back to the Kahanists. And really what it represents is I think Zionism going back to its roots. It's coming back home. Because the, the Zionism and the Israel that is represented by the so-called left or more moderate Zionism are the ones who committed the Nakba, are the ones who committed probably the worst crimes in Palestine, who took Palestine, who destroyed Palestine, and continue to destroy Palestine. The Kahanists have a big mouth. The rest of what's called mainstream Israel or mainstream Zionism are the ones that are committing the crimes. And they used to look, they used to try to put forward a kind of a friendly face, a liberal face. Uh, but the truth is that they are the ones who stole Palestine, they are the ones who expelled Palestinians, they are the ones who stole a country, not a, not a country that was barren and then they made it bloom, but they stole a country that was rich and blooming and pretended that it was a desert. And this whole claim that they somehow made the desert bloom, of course, is a big lie. They stole a country that was blooming. They stole the money from the banks, they stole the properties, they stole, um, they stole equipment, they stole public spaces. People usually think of the homes and the, the towns that were destroyed, but they, just, they stole an entire country. And they stole the narrative. And they did this by terrorism. The very first acts of terrorism in Palestine were conducted by the Zionists. Terrorism came to Palestine with Zionism. And in fact, going back to the comment I made earlier about the ultra-Orthodox community, in the year 1900, in the year 1900, when Zionism was barely on its feet, the rabbis of that community came up with a book, Orle Sharim, in Hebrew, where they warn the world, particularly Jewish people, of, the, of what Zionism will bring. And what they said was, in short, to summarize, that Zionism will bring violence to the Holy Land. And they were right, and that Zionism will ruin the good relations between Jews and Arabs and Jews and Muslims, and they were right. 
and that Zionism will also cast a doubt as to the loyalty of Jewish people, because Jewish people don't are not don't belong to Israel. They belong to wherever it is that they live. They're citizens of the world, and they were right on that too. They said this over a hundred years ago, and they were right on every single one of these. And so that we talk about terrorism, Zionism is terrorism. The state of Israel is terrorism. Today we're facing a reality, like we heard just now, where anybody who stands in opposition to terrorism is accused of supporting terrorism. Anybody who wants to send money to Palestine, anybody who wants to post about Palestine, anybody who talks about Palestine, anybody who's a campus activist for Palestine, anybody who's an attorney who works for Palestinian rights here in this country is treated like a terrorist, is accused of terrorism. How did we get to this place with this absurd reality where the, you know, the purveyors of terrorism, this massive terrorist entity, which is the state of Israel, is considered legitimate, and those who oppose it are considered terrorism? It's absolutely absurd. And now what they do is they say, yes, well, the terrorists are the Kahanists. The Kahanists, what, killed one person here, they put a bomb there, they made a few attempts to kill people. I don't think Kahana killed anyone with all this, you know, rhetoric, his, you know, poisonous, venomous rhetoric. But, the Israeli army, the Israeli pilots, with their nice uniforms, and their F-18s and F-16s and what have you, they don't burn one family, they burn hundreds of families. But that's legitimate because they wear uniforms and they speak politely. You know, so they, they kind of shift the blame of terrorism to these extremists who really never did anything. These guys don't even serve in the military usually. And the ones who do commit the terrorist acts, the ones who do murder thousands and thousands of people in Gaza, the ones who deny water to Palestinians in Nakba, the ones who shoot and kill innocent civilians, in Lid, in Ramle, in Haifa, and other places, they're not terrorists. This is self-defense. Self-defense against what? Palestinians have never had an army. They never had a tank. So we live in this absurd reality. And like you heard, when I worked on when I worked on the book Injustice about the book about the Herland Foundation, you know, there was a there. Well, one of the things that I read was I read you know thousands, thousands of pages of the court transcripts, because these guys were in court for years. There were three trials, a civil trial and two criminal trials. And when you read the transcripts of the, of the trials, you just, you just don't believe what you're reading. So they were accused, they couldn't be accused of terrorism, they couldn't exactly be accused of supporting terrorism, so they were accused of supporting organizations that were linked to Hamas, which in the 1990s was designated a terrorist organization. The problem was that those organizations on the ground in Palestine were legitimate relief organizations, the Khat committees, that other organizations around the world work with. Even America and even the State Department work with them. And one of the lawyers says at some point the only place that these committees are considered linked to terrorism was in the courthouse in the, in the Northern District of Texas, which is where the trial took place against the Oilland Foundation because everybody else worked with them and they were perfectly legitimate relief organizations. But they managed to twist and turn and twist and turn the story to a point where everybody looks at something straight in the face and claims that it's the opposite. The Holy Land Foundation did nothing wrong. These are the finest I met. You know, I visited four of these wonderful great guys and great gentlemen and in prison while well, they're still in prison. Two, two of them are out of prison. One's in, in ICE and one has been released. The finest people you'll ever meet. So they're the terrorists. And Israeli generals who retire from the Israeli military after decades of terrorism. Decades of terrorism. They go to Harvard, they go to Columbia, they go to all these universities for a year to over two years and get a degree, and they're out there speaking, and they get great gigs, making tons of money, at, of course, military and, and, and defense consultants. It's an absurd reality. 
And it's interesting, I landed yesterday, I, I landed 24 hours ago from Palestine. I was in Palestine for a couple of weeks. And the last few visits, my last few trips overseas, upon my return to Dallas Airport in DC, I get uh, called in for a secondary security screening. So you see on your boarding pass, you see all these S's. So they take you back to this other room, and I remember talking to Rabbi Weiss, telling Rabbi Weiss about this a while ago, and he goes, oh, they've been doing this for me for years. Because of course, you know, I don't have the kind of courage that, uh, that he and the other members of that community have visiting Lebanon and Gaza and Yemen and all these other places in Iran and so on to pursue this idea of peace, to pursue the real idea of talking to the, to, to the people. But um, at one point, they want to take my phone and they want to do this and you know, they were escalating this absurd reality very quickly. It wasn't my first time there, but it was the first time they really escalated it. And suddenly I was, you know, I was the enemy. And at one point, they we talked about my phone, and I said, well, you can't open my phone, it's, a, you know, it's, it's an iPhone, so it's hard. And he looks at me and goes, do you know who you work for? Kind of smiling. And I thought, I wanted to say, yes, I know exactly who you work for. I just came from there. You work for these rallies. You think you work for the U.S. government? The only reason, the only reason this whole apparatus of, you know, war on terror exists, this, 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 this horrifying, uh, bureaucracy exists is to support Israel. They're your real boss. But um, I think we have an ally now. We have a tool that's come out earlier this year that we haven't quite learned how to utilize, and that is the Amnesty Report. That for anybody who has not been paying attention and needed to see it, you know, written down, claims, not claims, demonstrates in very, very clear terms that the state of Israel is an apartheid regime and that it's been an apartheid regime since it was established in 1948. Not the West Bank, not Gaza, not Jerusalem. The entire state of Israel from its very beginning was and is an apartheid regime. Amnesty International says this. Of course, they're not anti-Semitic. But Amnesty International says this. So if we learn how to utilize that as a tool, then, some, then it gives us an opportunity to change the story completely. Because resisting an apartheid regime cannot possibly be terrorism. Right. Now, we know that all these organizations in Palestine have just been uh, deemed illegal by the State of Israel. All these uh, humanitarian organizations, human rights organizations. We know the Holy Land Foundation happened here and other organizations are being called well, either material support or right out terrorist organizations. But if you're fighting an apartheid regime, you're not a terrorist. If you are resisting an apartheid regime, if you are resisting oppression, you can't possibly be a terrorist. This turns everything around, and I think it gives us a great tool to turn this around, because when they come back and say, yes, but talking about Palestine, talking about the right of return, as we should be, talking about the right of Palestinians to stand up and resist, is supporting terrorism, our job is to say, hold on. Palestinians have never been engaged in terrorism. There is no such thing as Palestinian terrorism. They are resisting an apartheid regime. Now, many of us knew this before the report. But now the report is out by Amnesty. Amnesty is not a political organization. It's an organization that takes years before it comes out with a report which is so thorough, claiming that the state of Israel is an apartheid regime or is guilty of the crime of apartheid. It takes them years to come to this, and we, I know, we know many of the people that were involved and were part of the apartheid, of the amnesty report and contributed to it. So it's out there, and it's by an organization that by all, you know, by, by, by any measure, by any standard can be considered a completely non-partial, unpartial organization. So we have that. So this, if we know how to use this, and this is something I think we need to talk about, we know how to use it, we know how to utilize this tool as an incredible tool. And then we go back and say, wait a minute, it's not only an apartheid regime, it's also engaging in terrorism, which apartheid regimes tend to do anyway. They stole, and they killed, and they expelled, and they destroyed, and they haven't stopped for 75 years. It's not like they did something 75 years ago and now they stopped. The destruction, the killing, the expulsions. 
like Roman legions marching through the country. They destroy and destroy and destroy all the time. There's no such thing as a status quo in Palestine. People like to call this the status quo. What status quo? They've been marching on very, very clear to their destination of ethnic cleansing and the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of Alexa from the very beginning. So again, this report gives us an opportunity, I think, to bring all that back out and then claim the legitimacy back because the Palestinian struggle is the legitimate struggle and the Zionist campaign is the terrorist campaign, is the apartheid campaign. And no one's gonna say unless we do. No one's gonna do this unless we do. No one's gonna stand up and demand this kind of justice unless we do. So it goes back to us and reorganizing. And I'll say one last thing. You know, there's a tendency among those of us that stand for Palestine and among Palestinians to be satisfied with very, very little. There's this tendency to say, yes, but now you look, 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 they took down the checkpoint. Look, 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 they eased the restrictions. There shouldn't be any restrictions. There shouldn't be any restrictions. There should not be any occupation in Palestine at all. Nothing but a fully free, democratic, independent Palestine from the river to the sea should be an all the exception. And that's how we win. And that's how we actually will be able to free Palestine. Thank you very much.